Okay, <coughs> so welcome to the course today on um, the base filter. So the base filter is one of the basic concepts for state estimation that we are using here in that course for these two ways for approaching the simultaneous localization and mapping problem. And the idea today is to give a kind of short overview of how the base filter works, what's the concept of the base filter, and then look into one specific instance, the Kalman filter, as one implementation of the base filter. Today we will do that in a rather, let's say, abstract way, not really diving into the specific issues of the SLAM problem. So this will be covered next week when we really start implementing or realizing SLAM system um, with the excellent coming filter. So um, what's the goal, what we wanted to do? Um, it's all about estimating this probability distribution. So the state of some, some dynamic system, which may change over time, um, and the base on information, and this information we have is the Z here, which are observations that we obtain, and the controls U, um, which kind of tells us how the system actually evolves over time. So if you think about a robot, the X could be the state, um, it could be the position of the robot in the environment, or also be the full environment, or the environment model, as it will be called the problem. And the observations Z would be camera images or as a range finder information or whatever we use, and U could be odometry information or the um, commands sent to the robot, how the robot should move through the environment. And it's all about estimating this probability distribution. So um, the probability distribution about what the, the state of the system given the observation and the controls. And it's all about estimating this quantity. <clears throat> so this term here is also sometimes called the belief of the system. So given the information the system has, uh, where, for example, the belief where it currently is. So we have um, the belief about xt, so the current state of the system at times that t is a probability distribution over the variable xt given all the previous observations and controls we've taken. So that's the second thing. The first thing we're going to do if we have this distribution and we want to kind of um, manipulate this, this term over here in order to come up with a kind of receipt or um, uh, yeah, kind of a receipt on how to address the state estimation problem. The first thing we can do is actually to apply base rule. Who knows, who knows about base rule? Okay, not everyone. So base rule is one uh, equation. I'm not going to be right, so you have two random variables, A and B. And base rule simply tells you that you can, can transform P of A given B into P of B given A times P of A divided by P of B. This is what base rule tells us. And sometimes you also find the notation that this is actually a normalization which can be obtained by um, taking this term over here and iterating over all elements of P. So this is just a normalization term. And therefore, you sometimes also find the notation uh, for times P of B given A times P of A. So it's exactly the same thing, and here just this normalization constant covers one divided by P of B. So it's kind of the basic application of base rule without any special, um, any, anything special. This is exactly what we're going to do here. So the goal is to kind of swap the variables xt and zt using base rule. We can actually do that. So this is what you see here, the second line, how I wrote base rule using this normalization constant eta over here. What we've done here in this first equation, we swapped xt and zt. So now we have p of zt given xt, and then still given the all the old observations and given the controls. This is the first step, this corresponds here in the equation, uh, now equation here to p of b given a. So in this case, a is xt and b is zt, the equation we have in here. And the rest is simply the background knowledge we have. And then we have a second term, which is just p of a. So in this case, um, p of xt, given the rest, and now here the zt is missing. So it's not in here anymore. So in this equation, the b is not here anymore. It's no term. Okay. So this is just the implication of this. Was it clear to everyone? 
how the, where this line comes from, or is there anything else I, I should discuss here? Okay. So once we apply a phase rule, um, we can actually say that we can make um, so-called Markov assumption and say, just look to this term over here. And let's say, um, if we, if we know in which state the system is in, so we know xt, we want to know the distribution about, or the probability distribution about the observation of that t, given xt. All the information before, so where was it going in my previous information, don't really matter. Because the assumption is, given I know the state the system is in, uh, it's the current observation, or the probability distribution of the current observation is independent from the rest. So the market for some I can actually ignore this information. So this is what we can do. We can apply the market for such, and you see always this, the part of the equation where the, which is underlined in red, this, the part where it comes to this change. So this information here goes away. And this goes to P of the ZG given XG, which kind of the market for such. So given we know the state, we can actually ignore the rest of the path. Okay, and the second term, nothing has changed in the second term. So the problem, <coughs> if you want to want to work with this term over here, is um, we, have, we have the probability distribution about our current location xt, and we have no information about where the robot was before. It's pretty hard to estimate that the robot is, given that we have no prior information about the robot was before. So what we are what we're doing here is we use the law of total probability to actually introduce a new variable, xt minus 1, where we say um, we look at all possibilities where the robot has been in the previous point in time. Say, so given that the robot was there at the previous point in time, where would it move to the next point? So it's just the basic application of the law of total probability. So we introduce this kind of new variable, xt minus 1. We integrate over this variable, the variable is here added to the conditional term, times the probability that this variable is pure and the rest. This is just the background of which is the same. So this is the same if you say what the law of total probability here tells us here. So given we have variable P of A, this is exactly the same then we integrate over all possible outcomes of B, P of a given B times the probability that this really occurs P of B dB. So you just say the probability that an event A occurs is the probability that an event A occurs given B and the likelihood that B actually occurs, integrating over all possible all possible outcomes of B. Just the standard application of the law of total probability. And if we do that, we end up with this long term over here. Okay, and then um, we again want to apply the, we want to simplify this term over here. What's the possibility for us to simplify this term over here? So what the probability distribution about xt, given we know xt minus one and all the past center observation controls. How can we simplify that, this term over here? Any ideas? We consider to do the same trick we did here, go from this, from the second line to the third line. What about the idea here? Mm -hmm. Let's go on with this control, <coughs> just the last control, not all the previous ones. And exactly. So given that we know where the system is in time x, xt minus 1, we are only interested in the last control command. So how to go from, so the command ug, how the robot was steered from xt minus 1 to xt. All the past controls we completely ignore. Because if we know where the robot was at the previous point in time, it doesn't matter for us whether how the system was driving before that. Okay, we can do the same for the observations. What we see here, they are just the observations up to the time step um, t minus 1. Given we know the state of the system at t minus 1, these are all observations we have taken in the past that doesn't help us to estimate where we are at xt, given we know xt minus 1. We can actually 
get rid of these sensor observations here, and here we name the DUT. This again, mark of assumption. By the mark of assumption, so this term over here simplifies to this term, and we have here this term stays exactly the same, so no changes over here. Okay, look to this term over here. To which term does this term look not identical but very similar? Belief of x t minus one. Okay, so this looks this term over here looks pretty similar to our original belief to the except that we can replace t by t minus one. It's kind of a recursive term. The only thing which is different be is simply the last control command is still in there. So here's still the ut and um, it's just the same one over here, but all the other variables only go until the time set t minus one. We can again have a look. So if we want to estimate whether the system is at time t minus one, we can say it doesn't really help us to know which command we carried out for the in the future. So the next motion command the system carries out. Um, so this is again applying the macro assumption saying we ignore the last odometry command ut here. Of course, this is not, again, this is just an assumption that's not fully true because if I know which motion command I'm, I'm going to execute to go one step further, this can help me if the robot, for example, have two possibilities where the robot can, can be. One, at one point, standing directly in front of a wall, and one's standing in the free space. And if I give the robot the motion command of drives one meter forward, it's very likely that I'm not standing in front of the wall. There's a kind of some very subtle differences. In most of the cases, there's really no real gain of knowing about UT. So again, we apply the mark of assumption. Again, it's an assumption. and so just ignoring the last odometry command in here. So just going from u1 to t to u1 to t minus 1. The only thing is changing. OK, if we have that, this term over here is exactly the recursive belief over here. So it's a belief of xt minus 1. It can, we can simply replace that. So we can replace this equation here by this um, term over here. So it's a belief of xt minus 1. So it's a recursive formula. So this equation tells us how to go, given we know xt, the belief about xt minus 1, how can we go to xt? And in order to do that, we need two things. We need this term over here, which is the so-called motion model, which tells us how to, what's the probability distribution about xt, given we know xt minus 1 in the motion command carried out. This can, we can see that as, let's say the robot is in a certain position, it carries out a motion command. Let's say go one meter forward. The robot drives one meter forward, so now standing here. And what the probability distribution where the robot is ending up? So it may be that it traveled only 95 centimeters, maybe it traveled one meter two, something like this. So we often have a distribution which is, let's say, roughly um, and centered around the position where the robot is going to be. At least right. This is the first term we need to implement the base filter. The second term we need to know in order to implement the base filter is the first term over here. And this is the sensor model or the observation model. And um, this tells us what's the likelihood of an observation given we know the state of the system. So given that I'm standing, let's say, here, and the sensor is looking to this direction and is measuring the distance to the next obstacle, um, here's the wall, let's say, a three meter distance. So I expect to measure something around three meters if the robot is oriented in this direction. So if I would measure five meters, quite unlikely that I'm actually standing here. It's more likely that I may be oriented like this towards this wall is five meters away. Or that I'm standing two meters further away on that side. It's the other possibility. Okay. So these are the two models we need to know about um, the motion model and the observation model or the sensor model in order to realize the base filter. Any questions about this derivation of the base filter? This is kind of the base filter equation. Okay, and so we can actually take this term over here and split it up into two parts. The first one is this part over here, and this is the second part. And what the first part does, it says, given I know the state of the system, at, or given the belief in xt minus 1, how does the system evolve? So it can actually predict where the system will be in the next point in time. That's what this part of the equation does. And therefore, it's also called the prediction step. Well, the second step does here it actually tells us, given an observation, I can actually evaluate how likely, for example, are different positions or where the robot can be. So it's kind of a correction step. 
So the prediction, how does the system evolve? And then a correct correction step of the uh, predicted state. And therefore, it can be written as a, as I said, a prediction step. And the correction step, you always often find the prediction step written in this form over here. So the belief with the um, bar with an overlie on top. And so it's just splitting up this equation into uh, the prediction and into the correction. So this is the, the same equation here. And if you just put this line in here, you end up having the standard base filter. And therefore, um, if you see realizations of the base filter, you often see them executed in two steps, in the prediction step and in the correction step. And well, you can see now, if you write it this way, that for the prediction step, we need that motion model I was telling about. And for the correction step, we need the sensor model or observation model or measurement model, how they are called, in order to go from the, from the prediction, which is this one over here, um, to the belief at the current point in time. Do you have any questions about this? So about the base filter in general, or about this prediction and correction step? At the time zero, we have belief of zero. So we have some prior belief xt. This can be some prior belief that I know where the system. Let's say if I'm, if I'm considering the task of, of building a map of the environment, and um, so what x x zero can tell me is either I mean I have an initial belief that the robot is. So I can take this into account as prior information, or I can say I have no idea where the robot is. And then I can just estimate my whole model given some x0, some starting configuration. And that means if you say the robot started here, <coughs> it can tell you what the world looks like. If you say the robot started over here, um, the, it's, a, it's the same kind of relative estimate that the robot started, but it's just shifted in space. So it's kind of the degree of freedom I have in order to, let's say, for example, set up the set of the reference frame. Well, to be all the observations I do are relative observations. So a robot observes a landmark. So just can estimate, for example, the distance from its current post to the landmark. It doesn't tell um, the system anything about where is this landmark globally in space, which would give me some indication about x0. Therefore, I can use x0 to kind of fix my coordinate frame. Or if I have some prior information, I can use it. What people typically do is if they don't have any information, they just say, the robot stored at my self-defined reference frame, 0, 0, 0, starts from this point on. That would be one way for doing that. So it's not really effective further belief in the value you choose. If you don't have any further information, not. Maybe that you have some initial information, but someone provided you some evidence that the system started in some certain position, then you can actually exploit that. But most of the time, this is not the case. Okay, any further questions? Okay. <coughs> So um, there are different implementations or realizations of the base filter, um, because base filter itself can see as a general framework for doing um, state estimation, especially recursive state estimations. And different realizations of the base filter are um, use different methods or make, typically make different assumptions about um, the, the, how the state is distributed, about the different models that I use, like the motion model and the observation models. So one distinction between um, realizations of the base filter in terms of the models is that you may assume to have a linear motion model. So it means being able to um, describe the motion by linear function. This is an example of the observation model. If this is the case, you can actually simplify your state estimation problem. If this is not the case, you may, uh, need, to, need, may need to use some more advanced techniques in order to do your state estimation. And um, other things is, should the system, or can we assume that the system is um, Gaussian, distributed according to a Gaussian distribution and that the noise in the motion process and in the observation process is Gaussian? If this is the case, it's much easier for us to estimate, to do state estimation. If this is not the case, it gets more complicated. Other things are, um, can we even express this distribution in a parametric form, like a Gaussian or any other distribution? Or is it something we want to describe in a non-parametric way? This is the case. We also have, can, can use a different implementation of the base filter. And there are different properties about which assumptions you make, or let's say information you know about the problem you're, you're investigating, um, which um, has an impact on which kind of implementation of the base filter you should actually use. In the course here, we'll actually look into two different variants of the base filter. The first filter is the Kalman filter, and all its Kalman filter friends, different variants of the Kalman filter, which relax some of the assumptions. 
But in the very basic case, the Hubble filter says all the distributions are Gaussians and all the models are linear. So like a linear motion, linear uh, observation model. If everything is Gaussian, the Hubble filter is the best thing you can do. So Hubble filter is the optimal estimator given that you have <coughs> only linear models and everything is Gaussian. So there's no need to do something different if you have this assumption. The problem, however, is that in reality, especially the models you involve are non-linear models. Therefore, there are variants of the Kalman filter, like the extended Kalman filter, um, which uses linearized models, or does some approximations of these non-linear functions. We cover that in the second um, hour of the course today. And they are also um, another form of non-parametric filter. This is a particle filter. The particle filter is that it relaxes the assumption of having um, Gaussian distributions. The color filter can actually, it's a non-parametric form of estimating this, so we don't assume a parametric form um, for our distribution. And this is something we also will um, investigate in this course, how we actually can use the particle filter or variant of the particle filter um, in order to um, address this land problem. But that's it. For now, just to give you an overview of what we're going to do in the next weeks. And, um, but both of these filters have in common that we need we have to have some knowledge about the motion and the observations we make. Because these are the two models we need to know about in our filter. So if you look to the motion model, this is actually this term over here, what are different ways for realizing this motion? Actually, so you may even ask yourself, why do we need this probabilistic motion model? If I know which motion I executed or which command I executed, why can't I simply compute using, let's say, pure geometry um, to estimate where the other system is in the next point in time? Yeah. Well, obviously, because it's a uh, non-deterministic system. Yeah, exactly. So we have no assumptions. We make errors. We don't have the perfect systems. And therefore, we need this probability distribution. So the reason is robot motion is always is inherently uncertain, so there is no perfect system which actually does this. And this is one of the um, examples what you see here is an environment, so black obstacles, uh, wide free space, and the trajectory of the robot was driving around. So this was one of the early robotics competitions in the 90s at AAAI on robot localization. And if you just plot where the robot is going according to its odometry commands, and this was a system which already had good wheel encoders, which kind of count the revolution of the wheels and estimate where the system will be, the end up is something like this. So the robot started over here, if it just integrates its motion, it will end up on a trajectory which looks like this. And you can see that there's just already small errors in the motion in the, in the motion of the system, and here the error is not really big, end up in an inconsistent trajectory of, or trajectory estimate of the system in the end. So everything boils down to computing this posterior. How does the system move? from xt minus 1 to xt or x to x prime. Um, so in some of the equations I give in the next steps, I use x and x prime because you have less indices compared to x and xt minus 1. But always x refers to xt minus 1 and x prime refers to xt as a subsequent equations. And there are typically two different ways how the um, motion of the system is actually described. And this depends on the physical capabilities of your system. So if you have something what we call wheel encoders, or some tools for estimating the motion of the system, then you use to be so-called odometry-based model. It's like counting the revolution of the wheels, knowing the, the, let's say, the distance between the wheels, the, the diameter of the wheels, and all the properties, we can actually use um, standard motion equations to estimate where the system is likely to be, or rather, if, if they would be noise-free, I can actually compute where the system is. And the other thing is, if I don't have any sensors attached to the wheels, for example, I can use a so-called um, velocity-based model. And the velocity-based model just uses the commands I send to the robot, like I give you a rotational velocity, I execute a rotational velocity and a translational velocity, or the velocity of the right wheel and the left wheel, and estimate where the system will be according to that. And this is typically more uncertain because they're just the commands I send to the system. We have the odometry of the, the encoders actually measure how the wheels, um, let's say, um, rotate. And therefore, the odometry-based models are typically more accurate. So we distinguish between odometry-based models and velocity-based models. For the velocity-based model, this is typically the velocity I set to the system. And the um, odometry-based model uses encoders in order to get the information back. And it simply depends on your hardware platform. If you have a nice wheeled robot with, um, uh, with wheels and wheel encoders, you will always use the odometry-based model. 
But there are also systems where this is not possible. Think about a flying vehicle. There are no wheel encoders you could attach to any of the wheels because the system basically has no wheels in order to estimate where it is going. Or you can even think of lagged systems, so like humanoid robots. They also they have encoders typically in their joints, but um, quite often they are very inaccurate, or at least they are not comparable to the encoders you typically have attached to the wheels of the system. So let's start with the odometry based model because it's, the, it's a more accurate case. You can, what you typically want to do is, you, given two positions of the robot, where the robot is, how can I describe the relative motion, motion between these two positions? And um, this can be done based on these, these equations over here. So given that the robot moves from um, x, y, theta to x, y, theta of all the prime variables, and, you have the, and we have the odometry information which we want to compute, we want to express this motion by two rotations on the translations. So given that I have two poses in the environment, this is the first post and the second post. Then given I'm, let's say I start here, and I want to be here at the end. I can describe this motion to go from here to there by a rotation. This is the first rotation, rotation one. By a translation to my heading, and by a second rotation. And if I do that, I can actually use these equations to compute the parameters, these odometry parameters. So, for example, the, the translation, how much I have to move forward, is just the Euclidean distance between the two points, between the current location and the location where it's happening. And the rotations are given by uh, how much I need to rotate by, by uh, the arcus tangens function, um, in one case, minus orientation, and then we're just adding, adding and also subtracting the individual rotations. So to, to know that to go from here to here, looking in this direction, I need to rotate, let's say, by around 90 degrees first, I move forward and do a second rotation. How these two locations Okay, so given I have, oh yes, please. Uh, what is a ten two? So this is um, uh, the a ten function, but the problem is if you, this is kind of how to implement that if you use the a ten two function because it's defined in all four quadrants of the coordinate system, which is standard for a times not. So what you typically have, you have um, y divided by x in the, in the a ten function, but if x is zero, you run into problems this a ten two function that taken correctly into account on all these singularities. Okay. So just an implementation detail. But if you don't respect this implementation detail, you implement it with any time you need to be around into problems, etc. Okay, so given that we have noise in the system, how could we actually model the noise given that we have we assumed this model over here? How could we actually encode noise into that system? Okay, so the there may be noise in this rotation, transition, and second rotation, mm -hmm. and we should take them to that count. Yeah. So actually, you, know, kind you of can think about two ways. One is the really straightforward way, which is, let's say, given that I move, I simply say, given that I know where I was here, I assume a Gaussian error around this post. This is one way for doing that. The other way is what, what you said, that we assume to, since we, we moved somewhere to this new location, like this movement, we haven't we have an error in this, in this rotation. The first rotation, we have an error in the translation, and we have an error in the second rotation. And this is what the system normally does, or what it typically does. So assume a Gaussian error in the first rotation, you assume a Gaussian error in the translation, you assume again a Gaussian error in the second translation. So it means that your odometry vector is, um, is Gaussian distributed, and typically assume a zero mean error, so that you don't have any systematic error. Let's say always a drift to the right hand side or something like this. So this is kind of the standard way um, to describe the, the errors introduced in this kind of motion. And if you do that, you typically end up with distribution that look like this. So given the robot, for example, here was, was, was looking to this direction. It first did a rotation, moved forward, and then again a rotation. So at the end, the system really is moving something like this. Then this is a probability distribution you get. So the darker the value is the higher the probability that you end up there. And um, so these are different variants. So for example, in this model, which is a very banana-shaped model, um, you can see that you had typically a small, small error in the translation of component, because the banana is very flat, but a, a huge error in the rotation of components, because you have the banana is very long. Compared to this case, where you seem to have a pretty good orientation estimate, but you have a high error in your translation. And therefore, these distributions look different. 
You can also represent it by samples. So given that you start here with the raw button, let's say 100 or 500 times you execute that motion, wherever you end up, you make one of those dots over here. And you will get distributions which look like this. Samples. Well, how did you compute the, um, the graphics on the top row? Um, what you, you, they were computed in the forward mode. So you simply, um, the easiest way to compute this is a sampling procedure. So you sample those points, you do this over and over and over again, and these are small bins of a small histogram. You simply count the number of, of samples which fall into those bins. Do this over and over and over again until the full space is covered, and then this is the way you actually generate those plots, all the, pl all the plots that we generated here. Okay, so do this like a million times, and then yeah, it counts. Well, then you simply count how number, uh, how many of those samples fall into these small bits. So it's a small discretization of the of the space. Here, only shown in two D, but in reality, it's the three D Any further questions about this? Okay, so this is a standard odometry motion model. So if I ask you about the odometry motion model, you know that you can describe this by two rotations and a translation, the Gaussian, or the, the noise you typically introduce can either be globally Gaussian, which is the easy case, but doesn't really reflect very well reality. Um, but you typically, what is closer to reality is to assume we have a Gaussian error on the individual components. Because you can already see that these distributions here are actually far away from a Gaussian distribution. Or maybe you could model this by a Gaussian distribution, but at least this guy over here is not Gaussian. Okay. So everyone has a basic idea what a motion model does. It, it describes these distributions. How the work goes from t minus 1 to t given one motion command. If there's anything unclear about that model, tell me now. Yeah. Um, but it's always like, uh, how to say, discretized into two steps that you always have like a rotation and a movement and not both at the same time. So this is your model assumption. Okay. In reality, the robot, of course, didn't turn on the spot, move forward, and rotate it again. But in reality, for example, this was probably a smooth motion where the robot was driving something like this. Mm -hmm. But this is just your way of describing this. It's a simplified model mm -hmm. on how you want to express that. Mm -hmm. If you have more information, like if uh, more information about the shape of the trajectory, you may come up with more evolved and mm -hmm. error models which better fit reality. But if you don't have that information, Something you do here is you have two points in time, one odometry command in between, how can we actually represent that? That's one way for doing it. But it never claims that this is the optimal way, it's just a standard way how to do that. If you have more information, you're happy to exploit that, of course. And in like, realistic applications, how, how big would these steps usually be? This simply depends on the accuracy of your um, wheel encoders. So they typically have a number of ticks they have per rotation. Some have, let's say, 500 ticks per rotation, some have more, some have less. And depending on the, um, the ticks you get while the wheel is turning, um, and the better the computer is, the smaller embedded board is that integrates these motion, um, the more often you get your updates. So typical robotic system have updates from four times per second to I don't know, 20 times per second, something like that. Something in that area. We have by more expensive devices. Um, then you even get look at high, the motion updates at a higher frequency. If you buy really crappy ones, you may even lower all frequency. But the standard robots you typically find is something between 4 hertz and 20 hertz, approximately. I mean, very rough estimate. Any other questions? OK. So let's come to the um, second kind of model we can have with, which is the so-called velocity-based model. And here, what typically assumes we have a translational velocity and a rotational velocity. So you see, if you execute the command of the robot, it drives forward with a certain velocity and rotates with a certain velocity. And if we assume that at every point in time or in every discretized time steps, these velocities are constant. If they are constant for short intervals, that means that the robot drives in a circular arc. So with a constant translational velocity and a constant rotational velocity, the robot will drive in a circular arc. So, you, for example, the robot started over here. I execute my motion command, translation velocity and rotational velocity. So, omega is typically the rotational velocity and B the translation velocity. The robot will move on this circular arc 
And depending on kind of my, my, my time slots or how long my individual time steps are, it will just move a little bit or very long on that circular arm. So the robot is here and will end up somewhere over here. You can actually compute a center of rotation and use this center of rotation, which is in this example, this point over here, to estimate the properties of this motion. And if you do that, um, you may end up with an equation, or you should end up with an equation which looks like this. So these are the new positions, these are the old positions, and these are the updates where delta t is the length of the time interval, so how long it, you executed this motion command. Um, v is the translation velocity, omega the rotation velocity, theta is the current of the initial heading of the robot, and um, you can see that, for example, the heading update is just the, trans the rotation velocity times the, uh, the, the time step you executed that, and for the x y position. A little bit more complicated, but still it's kind of standard uh, trigonometry updates in order to come up with this equation. Okay, so do you see, so those who have attended robotics one, <laughs> they should be silent for my next test because they don't trick it yet. Um, what kind of problem do you encounter with using <coughs> this kind of model? To think about what's the difference between this model and the previous odometry model. So before we had a rotation, a translation, and a second rotation. Here we have a translation of velocity and rotation of velocity. What's structurally different between those two? Okay. Um, maybe in one case you have um, distance move or, you know, or rotation. In the other case you have velocity. So you're integrating over time in the second case. Yes, this could be one thing, but this is not the important thing I want to look into. So you think about them as vectors. So one is a three-dimensional vector, the other one is a two-dimensional vector. What does that mean? So you have a robot that moves in the three-dimensional space x, y, and in one case, you describe the motion as with a three-dimensional parameter, but you go from one position to another position. In the second example, in this one over here, you just use a two-dimensional vector to describe this transformation. What's structurally different? What promise it can be? Well, um, in the second case, you only have a two-dimensional vector, so you're kind of missing information. But underlying that is that this is kind of assuming a kind of bicycle model of some sort, some sort of where so in the first case, you're doing turn, move, turn, and here you're only doing move and turn in one thing. Mm -hmm. So you don't have that second turn at the end of the step. Yeah, exactly. So the problem you have in here, as you said correctly, you just have a two degree of freedom to describe the motion in one case, and three degrees of freedom in this. Uh, in, the, in the first case, a three degree of freedom uh, odometry command, and here a two degree of freedom odometry command. That means, in the end, you will end up in a manifold of the original space, in a subspace of the original space, in this example. That means you cannot reach all positions where you want to end up with. The reason for this is that this describes the movement of a circular arc. So if you, for example, look into the fact you have a solid location over here and you can select any other location in the space, you can actually draw in a circle that you end up at that point. Whatever you use. You can actually draw that circle. So I can actually find every point of the plane to do that. However, what it's constrained into is at these endpoints over here, the orientation is constrained by, uh, by that circular arc. So what you can't do is select an arbitrary rotation at all these points. And this is one of the problems you have with this model. What people do in order to fix this is kind of a small dirty trick take the same equation over here, and add a second noise term in here. And this is a noise term you have in your final orientation. So if, you, if you're perfectly on your circular arc, but you're a little bit rotated to the left-hand side, you can say, oh, this is additional noise. I have a lot of rotation, which is just additively added. So that you end up with having three components describing the motion. So uh, the translation velocity, the rotation velocity, and this gamma parameter here. Yes, please. Uh, 
Virtually, the, this, this approach here, you can assume that your robot looks has a certain design, as in you can't turn on the spot. Uh, you can turn on the spot here. Yeah, but this model doesn't account for it. I mean, that's what they're saying, right? Okay, so... Um, no, but, uh, okay, what you mean is, um, what this would mean is, you first move on a circular arc and then you turn on the spot. This would kind of, you can, exit, you can describe the motion as two subsequent motions, sure. but then you end up having exactly the three parameters, which would be the translation velocity and the rotation velocity in the beginning, then you don't move, so your second translation velocity is zero, and you have your second rotation, then you again have your three-dimensional, your, your 3D components. But if you, so the reason why, I bring up this, if you look to the typical way you steer most of the robots you have, you can typically set a translation and a rotation velocity. Therefore, you have this two, there are two parameters only. And but in order to describe the motion fully, you need the third noise parameter to enter your system. And if you do that, you can again describe the different motions you obtain with the velocity-based model. And what you can you see actually here that they are very, look very, very similar to the um, odometry based models, the, 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 the shapes of those distributions over here. So you end up with very similar distributions, except that the odometry based information is typically more accurate because you use the wheel encoders, whereas in the velocity based model, this is not the case. Okay, so if you want to, to kind of to sum up these um, models here, if you need to describe the motion uh, where you just need to set, you just have access to the translation and rotation velocity, use this kind of um, model to estimate your next motion, and if you have real odometry information, um, then you <coughs> will use this equation. Okay? okay? So these are kind of the two basic um, motion models that you will encounter in this course. The next model which is relevant for us is the so-called sensor model. So it was the second term in the correction step of the base filter, P of the T given XT. Okay. What models are typically? Let's for the beginning assume we have a laser range scatter. This was this device which provides the proximity information to the closest obstacle in the dense way. So the first thing people assume is that those the individual laser beams are independent of each other. So given what I measure in this direction, it's independent from what I measure in this in the in this direction. Let's we can argue that this is typically the case if you um, if those beams are very distant to each other. As soon as you decrease the angular difference between those two beams, the more likely it is that they are actually dependent. So if you measure in this direction and then uh, whatever, a fraction of a degree to the right or left hand side, you're quite likely to measure the same thing or very similar value. Of course, it could be, let's say, at a corner and once you look on the right hand side of the corner, once on the left hand side of the corner, but this typically doesn't happen that often. It's more likely that they are actually not independent. But the standard model assumes that they are independent. And given they are independent, you can actually say it's a product of the probability distributions of the individual beams. So I can look into all the individual beams, or all the beams completely independent of each other, with the standard assumption. And then you, what you typically have, you have something like a so-called beam endpoint model, it's one of the standard models you use. So given these are obstacles in the space, and this is the direction where the robot measures, um, so here the darker the value is, the higher the, uh, the lower the probability that the beam should actually uh, should, should end up here. So this will be a low probability. If the beam would have ended somewhere over here, it would have been higher probability. What this beam endpoint model does, it simply completely ignores what is according to the map between the robot and the endpoint when it measured. Just looks at the endpoint. So is there something in my map um, in the distance and direction from where I measure it? You ignore what's kind of in between. Just look at the endpoint. That was also called a beam endpoint model. The advantage of this is very efficient to compute. So given that the robot is here, we just need to compute where this endpoint will be according to your measurement. And, oh, sorry, here. And then look up in the map how far is this point from an obstacle. And therefore, it's actually often used to what you see here. This is um, a standard occupant or standard map where white represents free space and black represents um, obstacles. If you can transform this into a so-called lightning field, so there's this one over here, and so if the robot is some is some at some location that they're here, it measures in this direction, and if the beam ends up here, it will get a high value and a low value. These both models are very uh, 
strongly correlated. You just look to the endpoint. That's the simplest model. If there's an obstacle where you're measuring, say, red that fits well, if it's far away from an, from an obstacle, say, it's very unlikely. So it's going to be what if there's something in the path? This is completely ignored in this beam endpoint model. So, um, why do we do that? It's um, mainly a reason, so there are two reasons. Um, the first one is efficiency, that otherwise I would need to do kind of a ray tracing along, along all cells which are on the way to the obstacle, which is costly. And the other thing is that this ray cast model um, can also lead to some other artifacts. So if your map, for example, is not absolutely perfect, or if there are some other effects you can have that uh, the, the, the ray cast model actually rates a beam as having a very low, probably low likelihood, although this is not the case. Um, this typically due to the absolutely perfect map assumption and that the one model is more critical to that than the other model. These are some details we may experience later on. Um, it's just hard for me to explain that now without having um, some of the tools that have we need later on, of course. Uh, I was just, because you, now you said why the other model, the, the uh, ray tracing model isn't as good, which I understand, but my question was, um, don't we see artifacts of using this beam endpoint model um, in it? But yeah, I, mean, it, 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 I don't say that one is better than the other. This yeah. is not what I think. One of the models has advantages in one or the other setting. So if you have the absolutely perfect map, yeah. and the beam, the, the ray cast model can have advantages because if let's say I'm, I'm measuring this direction here and I measure 20 meters, if it's actually clear that I can't be in that room because of the wall. Although perhaps at 20 meters away there's a wall of another room and the beam endpoint model would say it oh, fits perfectly. Although your physical knowledge tells you that this beam doesn't go through this wall over here. There's something which is ignored. If the map is absolutely perfect, um, the ray casting model has advantages. If the map is not absolutely perfect or not super perfect, it can be the case that the beam endpoint model turns out to be a more robust model because you don't discount beams which are in reality fitting well to the map, just yeah. because of some map artifacts. And um, so there's not that many validations which say one model is absolutely better than another one. From my own experience, the beam endpoint model works surprisingly well, so it ignores the physics that, uh, let's say, a proximity ring cannot get a path to a wall. The Raycast model and the other model, which you just uh, said before, so let's say, given this the robot uh, stands over here and looks in this direction, let's say, here in the 1D case would be an obstacle. What the Raycast model typically says is, um, it's very likely that I will have measured the, the expected distance together with some noise. Um, and it also accounts for a few other effects, like um, there may be persons walking around the environment. And then there's a higher likelihood that I measure something in front of that, uh, of that um, expected uh, proximity. There are some other values which are kind of constant probability, accounting for the fact that I don't know what happens, and a certain probability of obtaining a so-called max range reading. So, um, but there's um, nothing. So this corresponds to kind of the max range reading that extends the, 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 the range of the scanner. Um, this, this model here is actually a mixture of four different models, um, but that's again something um, I just would like to mention that there are alternatives to these beam endpoint models. We won't dive into all the details of the different models here in the course, just to give you an idea that there are different ways for doing this. So the beam endpoint model and the raycast model are two models I can use if I were with one of with dense maps, kind of grid maps. There's another model which is, can actually come up, which is the um, model for feature observations if you have a range viewing sensor. Like we have this example, um, they had, you can actually go to the open park and you have a proximity sensor and you, you look to um, object that you observe, which will, are very likely to be trees or look like trees. You can estimate the, the, the range to the trees from your sensor as well as the bearing of your sensor to your sensor. And this is what you typically call a range bearing observation. So uh, this is a range, the second term here is a bearing. And can, given that you have, given that you know where the features are, so where the trees are in the environment, you can say um, the range should be the Euclidean distance between the, the object where it is in the map and the location of the robot currently, it's the Euclidean distance, and the, um, the bearing should depend on the where this, these two point the position of the robot and the feature are distributed in space and where the robot currently looks to. This is kind of a standard model, plus you typically have a noise term over that as well. 
kind of the standard feature base for range viewing model. And this is also one model you will be faced with in the one of the exercises in the next week. Okay, so just to wrap that quick introduction to the base filter to wrap that up. Um, the base filter is a framework for state estimation. There are different realizations on how to actually implement that. And to one of them, the common filter, we will actually look um, in a few minutes. And um, in order to implement the base filter, you typically need two different kind of models. The one is um, uh, the motion model, or which is used for the prediction step, and the um, sensor observation model, which is used in the correction step to compute your belief. And um, I very quickly looked into some of the standard models for here, laser based range sending, like for this um, dense maps and for these feature based maps. And um, if you want to know more about them, you say, hmm, the space filter was less familiar than I thought. Here, if you reference what you can, what you can look into, there's first chapter two of the Probabilistic Robotics book, which I can recommend. Um, and then there's also from the last semester's course, Introduction to Mobile Robotics, chapter five, the video recordings, and there's kind of a whole hour on the motion model whole hour or two hours on the um, observation models. So you can actually look into more details if you think um, that it's needed. And um, oh, this was just the base filter, sorry, and the motion observation models. There are also two different chapters in the book and each 90 minutes course um, video recordings from uh, last term will be go more to the details. Are there any questions about the base filter? <coughs> 